Welcome to this first talk on common snakes of Belize. My name is Isabelle Paquiduron and we will go over a brief introduction, talk about some of the benefits of snakes, introduce the classification of snakes of Belize. We will talk about identification of snakes, some of the main criteria to use. Then we will introduce our Belizean venomous snakes as well as some common non-venomous snakes that are commonly seen. And we will talk about avoiding snake bite, what to do in the case of a snake bite. That much for our contents for this talk. So first things first, I am not an expert in snakes. I am a veterinarian with a PhD in parasitology and I work as a wildlife veterinarian consultant and educator. I've spent by now 26 years in wildlife rescue and we work with all species. I started with mammals uh, in general rescue centers then learned a lot about birds because that's the biggest proportion in rescue centers but as of the last 15 years I have worked more and more with reptiles and certainly developed an interest in snakes and learned all I could. Um, the Belize Wildlife and Referral Clinic I will introduce briefly right now. Uh, we are a registered nonprofit. We work under an agreement with the Wildlife Department uh, here in Belize. Our vision as an organization is conservation and sustainable development in cooperation. The clinic's mission is a bit lengthy, but it's to support wildlife conservation, animal welfare, as well as the veterinary profession with veterinary care, education, research, and everything we do is in collaboration. So what we do on a daily basis is we provide care for imperiled wildlife, from orphans to animals rescued from the illegal traffic. We hope to be a voice for humane treatment of animals, and we do provide environmental education for future generations. So a bit more, uh, we provide veterinary care and surgery for all species. Uh, we also provide veterinary support in the field. Uh, we take on rehabilitation for certain wildlife species, which includes snakes. Uh, we do provide some support for captive breeding programs uh, in conservation efforts. And since 2012, we are actually now approaching about 3,000 wildlife patients that have been uh, received free, have received free care and or rehabilitation through the BWRC. We do also do some referral services for domestic animals and some basic orthopedic surgery. But the most important thing we do as an organization is providing training and workshops and this is not only for partners and other professionals and public outreach here in Belize, but um, also now more and more online and virtually. Uh, the value of services for now is, has surpassed 150,000 US dollars to the government of Belize, that is. So now let's talk about snakes finally. The benefits of snakes, uh, of course they've been around for forever and probably their biggest benefit that we as humans can appreciate uh, is to control rodent populations. My favorite story from a farmer here was that he knew about a boa that would enter his corn storage with some regularity and he would just let her be, let her be in there. He knew she would come in for maybe a couple of weeks. She would eat all the rats that would otherwise affect his corn. And then 
she would go away. He knew she didn't mean him any harm and she was actually useful. So that's one of my favorite stories uh, of snake coexistence, so to speak. So aside rodent uh, predation, the snakes also control populations of other uh, species like frogs and lizards, uh, as well as other snakes, which brings us to a next argument for keeping a lot of snakes around which are renowned to eat the venomous snakes for example. We have some examples of that uh, at the end of this uh, presentation. Last but not least snakes don't just work as predators they also serve as prey for some other predators. Uh, for example this ultra rare raptor on the little picture on the right there that does not look as spectacular as he is rare. That is a solitary eagle which is renowned to prey on snakes including venomous snakes. So that snake pictured there is actually a rattlesnake. Oh and before I forgot that uh, picture on the left is a musurana. Uh, that picture will actually return. So to the classification of snakes here in Belize we have 63 known species. Out of that the vast majority, nearly 50 species, are colubrid snakes. These are not venomous to humans. So we have to say to humans because Almost all snakes are actually venomous, uh, but depending on the size of their prey, of course, they pose no danger to humans. For example, an earthworm eating a blind snake does not pose any threat to a human. Uh, aside the colubrid uh, species, we have one species of boa, and that is the only species that is not venomous at all because they do not even have fangs. Of course they do have teeth and they can bite but they possess no venom. Then we have six species of vipers. These are probably the most dangerous to humans but again not all of them are as dangerous. Uh, they do have anterior articulated fangs which makes them uh, particularly dangerous or able to bite uh, even if uh, they're a small snake. And they possess hemotoxin. Then we have two species of elapids. Those are our coral snakes. The coral snakes have fixed fangs which means they cannot rotate their fangs out of their mouth basically to bite and they are very small species. So while they are extremely dangerous to humans with their neurotoxin, it is not as easy for them to bite us and we will talk about snake bite prevention which can actually be very simple for coral snakes. And then we have a couple more groups of blind snakes uh, that are very rarely seen live mostly underground and are not venomous. So with that we will talk a little bit about how to identify snakes and the general criteria at first are of course the color, their pattern, uh, size of the snake as well as the size and shape of the body, um, the head shape and pupils, even though that is something to preferably check from a picture from a distance, not by going very close until you know that it is indeed not a venomous snake. And then you can also identify species or the location of where you see a snake will help you identify the species. How do we stay safe? Of course the easiest way is to learn our venomous species first because there are only eight venomous snakes in Belize and most of them are rare. So to show some of these criteria you see the picture of the eyes there. There is a vertically elliptical pupil which can be an identifying criterion for a viper and then there is a round pupil 
which could identify a colubrid snake. We do have the head shape that you see on the bottom there, which could be more triangular shaped. That could indicate that this is a viper. Uh, the triangular shape can be caused by venom glands in the back portion of their head, basically. You could also see that they do have a pit or a heat sensing organ. I have a pointer here between their nostril and their nose, which again, that is a morphological criterion that you would need to be fairly close and take a good picture from the distance. Uh, so we do not recommend you go close to see if there is a pit. If you are to notice that there is a pit in the face of the snake, then it is guaranteed to be a venomous snake here in Belize, uh, one of our six pit vipers. And the other criteria we will go through as we look at our venomous snake species now, uh, one by one. First, a few words on snake venom. We have two major types of uh, snake venom. One's the hemotoxin, the other one's the neurotoxin. Our pit vipers all carry hemotoxin, which Generally, a hemotoxic bite tends to be immediately painful and leads to bleeding and then later on tissue necrosis. This is, of course, life-threatening. While dry bites are possible, the only response is immediate hospital care if a bite is suspected. Uh, when it comes to neurotoxin, there is usually not that much pain and the onset of symptoms is often delayed, which may lead to humans believing that there isn't a problem and delaying the trip to the hospital, which can then have fatal consequences. Neurotoxin will lead to paralysis and cause death by respiratory paralysis. Again, immediate hospital care is needed if a bite is suspected. So now to our Belizean venomous snakes, the pit vipers. The most notorious one and most common and feared, probably rightfully so, is the so-called fertilance which is also called yellow jaw by common name due to the yellow tinge that you can see in that picture. Uh, they're also referred to as Tommy Goff here in Belize and their real name or their Latin name is Botrops Asper. What you can see here is a pit. This here is the nostril. This is the pit. Here is the eye. The pupil is vertically elliptical. That is the heat sensing organ of pit vipers. The head shape is pretty triangular. It's not that obvious in these images here. What you recognize these guys by is the pattern. It's the brownish color with triangular saddle patterns with these two dots underneath that is very regular down the entire body. So the fertile ends can get pretty large and long, up to eight feet, and they are renowned for having a little temper, potentially, or how you may say it, as in most snakes will avoid you and leave as soon as you come around, but fertile ants may sometimes just stay where they are, and if you do not pay attention, um, then you're at risk of getting bit. They are... Uh, their bite is dangerous uh, as an adult as well as in small uh, babies, but the pattern stays the same. It's obviously smaller on the babies, but it doesn't change, and it is quite obvious on the babies as well. So this one is truly our one species to be very uh, careful with or weary of and watch out for because the species is also the most common cause of envenomation in Central America, snake bite envenomation.
So here our lecture is not interactive, so I can't wait for anybody guessing. Uh, for me, that is a lovely species because its name matches a bit its looks. This is the so-called eyelash viper because of these little protrusions over the eyes that obviously are not eyelashes as they are in us, but they look like it and they gave it its common name. The Latin name is Botrops schlegeli. This species is arboreal, so you will generally see them in trees and rarely on the ground. They are quite short. Uh, they do come in different colors. So while for some the color is the sole identifier in this species, they can be seen in yellow and brown and green and in some cases with some patterns as well. For now they are all considered one species, but I believe there is some discussion about that. You can also see on this picture here your general criteria. Again, here is the heat sensing organ, the pit, your vertically elliptical pupils, and the triangular shaped head is again hard to see. This species is not known to cause envenomation here in Belize, and their prey is rather small and while their venom is of course dangerous to us, again there have not been reported bites of the species. A next pit viper here, our neotropical rattlesnake. This is an unusual species in that it carries the hemotoxin of the pit vipers, but it also carries a neurotoxin. Unlike the North American rattlesnakes, as far as I am told, which carry solely the hemotoxin. So by bites, this would be the worst to contract. Again, to say that firsthand, there are no reported bites of a rattlesnake here in Belize, at least in the last 15 years. They can be, their identification can be aided by their location because they are prevalent in pine savanna and grasslands, so they are not countrywide. They're not aggressive, they will generally give a warning and use their rattle and then coil up if they feel threatened. Uh, so if walking in an area that is potentially their habitat, one has to keep their eye, ears peeled to hear and listen out carefully to make sure that you don't accidentally um, threaten one. The recognition is same as the other pit vipers, uh, the triangular shaped head, and of course these have a classic saddle pattern as well, and they have a rattle, which that should give it away. Again, the first recommendation is keep a safe distance. Do not step too close until you have determined what your species is. Another rather interesting pit viper species from Belize, the jumping viper, uh, that has some myths associated with it, as in it would or could jump and really jump after its prey, which is not the case. The name Jumping Vape Viper came from the way that it hunts and strikes and seems to jump in the air when it strikes. This is another small species, usually no more than four feet. They can be recognized by the saddle pattern, triangular shaped head, pit, and pupils. They are now reportedly very mild mannered, but hemotoxic. Again, no reported bite of a human for the species um, in Belize. The Next species of pit vipers of Belize is the Mexican moccasin or cantil. 
by Latin name Archistorum bilineatus, which comes after those two lines on the face that are also characteristic identifying marks. Aside the other mentioned criteria already, you can see the pupils, the pit is not very visible in these images. You can see the triangular shaped head. This is yet another small species with hemotoxin. And their natural history snippet there is that they use this, you see this tail here, they stick it under leaves and then wiggle the tail to attract little predators who bite this thinking it's a worm and then they themselves fall prey. This is another example of a species where the identification can be aided by location because they are currently only recorded in the northern districts of Belize. Our last venomous snake of Belize for this list is the so-called hognosed viper. This is another beautiful snake that you can identify by its name, you could say. They are very small, they rarely exceed two feet. They're often found on ruins and have therefore sometimes been reported by tourists who have taken pictures of them. They prey on frogs and while their hemotoxin can be dangerous to humans, there are no reported bites of humans by this species. And it's another species that is not in the entire country, but found in southern Belize. So to come to our two species of venomous snakes that are not pit vipers, the elapids, we have two species of Microurus. One of them is found in southern Belize, so the one to the right. Coral snakes in general are slender snakes. Their body is very small and not like the previously shown vipers who all have bigger bodies. While they may have short bodies, they have big round bodies and coral snakes have very slender bodies like maybe a finger size uh, for an adult. Their length rarely exceeds three feet. They're active at dusk and dawn, as are most species. Their fangs are fixed, and they have very small mouths because they're small snakes, which means that they can only bite us between our fingers or toes on that little skin that is there which means it takes some negligence to actually get bit by a coral snake uh, through walking somewhere barefoot where you can't see. So if a bite occurs, it's very dangerous and life-threatening to humans um, by its neurotoxin. You can see the recognition. So main recognition for coral snakes here is the color pattern. And that is red, yellow, and black banded over the entire body. And you can see that in both of these species, the banding is slightly different, but it follows the same color pattern down the entire body. We have a little slogan here that is generally not recommended to use ever as a sole identifier, but you may have heard uh, red touch black, friend of Jack, red touch yellow, like here and here, deadly fellow, which for our two species here in Belize applies, where if red touches yellow, then it, um, in the banded snake, would be a coral snake, where is when red touches black, we will see that species here in a moment, um, that is not a coral snake. The main criterion to identify them is color, banding pattern, and size. So if you see that color pattern on a big-bodied snake, you can be sure that it is not a coral snake. A 
question, this brings us to our first non-venomous snake, the boa, baula, or by Latin name, boa constrictor. These are big bodied snakes and they can reach up to 12 feet. They're fabulous rodent hunters. They do not possess fangs or venom because they kill by constriction. This species was actually worshipped by both uh, Mayans and Aztecs, but it also has a lot of fears associated with it, as do all snakes in our part of the world. And this brings us to another fabulous non-venomous snake species, the king snake, which is very often killed for its looks. So in this presentation we will have a number of species now that are all killed for its looks because they have red, black, and or maybe yellow on them. Uh, and they're feared erroneously. The king snake harmless to us and they love eating venomous snakes, which is why we try to strongly encourage people to leave the species alone, because they're very beneficial. So the main criterion to recognize these easy from a distance from a coral snake is when they're adults, because they will be really big, up to five feet long, and big body, so nothing like a finger, but more like a good sized arm. And in this case, their red bands will always touch black. Okay. Oops, 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 sorry. No, malfunction. Oops. Sorry about that. I hope I'm back. Let's see. We are with the king snake here, and next is the black tailed indigo snake. This is Another example of a snake that loves to eat other snakes, including venomous snakes. It's a very cool species to be recognized by some of these characteristical facial markings, for example, and one of the few species, in my, to my knowledge, that have a different color in the front of the body, which is brown, and the back of the body, which is looks black from afar, has a lot of bluish tinges when you look up close in between. They can grow pretty big and they're reasonably shy by nature, so you do not see these as often. Um, but I repeat, it's a great snake to keep around because it will eat other snakes, including fertilances. And that brings us to the snake that was in the um, introduction slide there, too. I hope you can recognize and already remember this pattern here on this snake with those triangles and two dots. That is a fertilizer being consumed by a musurana. So musuranas are also most wonderful snakes when you are afraid of venomous snakes. And here is a juvenile musurana, which is unfortunately bright red, beautiful, but to our humans here is elicits fear and often makes them get killed for their looks as well, because they are in fact red and they have a little black and whitish yellow even though it's not banded and there are some other differences as well so this is the musurana not dangerous to us and that brings us to four more species of very beautiful snakes here in belize the so-called vine 
and tree snakes from the green tree snake on top there to the green vine snake underneath you can see the vine snake has the really pointy nose the tree snakes have the slightly more blunt nose and on the in the middle on the bottom there we have the one that I have personally seen the most commonly too, the Mexican vine snake with these pretty colorings that go down uh, the entire body. So these are very thin slender snakes. They are boreal, so you will generally see them in the trees. You may sometimes see them cross a road between tree patches. They are rear fanged and they have a mild venom. You will often see pictures of them with open mouths and threatening, um, but they are not dangerous to us. Their prey in general is something like frogs and the likes, but you could be lucky enough to see one of them. And you would recognize them by looking like a vine or a a thin long stick and then it starts moving. This is another species that is rather commonly encountered here and not venomous. The so-called coffee snake, a very cool name, Nina Zebe. The maximum length is 10 inches so they're very small but they're very commonly killed for their colors because again they have red on them, black and a little bit of yellow. Note that they have no bands whatsoever down their body. But they get killed for their looks, uh, even though they almost never bite and they are absolutely harmless to us and prey on earthworms. So something that lives on earthworms probably could not do as much harm or kill a human. No, they can't. Sorry. Another very pretty and rather common snake around here, the cat-eyed snake. There are two species um, as well. And they get killed for their looks. Because, unfortunately for the species, they mimic a viper. Their pupils, unfortunately, are not rounded as they are in the other colorate species but vertically elliptical so that is a generally a criterion for vipers right but not in this case and when this snake feels threatened they will flatten their head and make it look more triangular shaped so they really try to sell themselves for a viper and Around humans, unfortunately, that is somewhat of a guaranteed death sentence uh, in the developing world out of fear. This species does not have front fangs, they have rear fangs. They are absolutely harmless to humans. And you can probably tell them apart even in this picture, if you go look back at the previous viper pictures, by the size of their eyes. So vipers have that heat sensing organ here that helps them detect prey and their eyes in general are much smaller in comparison to the size of the head. Whereas these guys, nocturnal using their eyes to hunt, have much larger eyes in ratio to the head. Um, their skew pattern on the head here is also indicative of being a colubrid snake and the lack of a pit in the face. There we are. Here is our next venomous snake uh, commonly seen in Belize. The tropical red snake, or a very cool common name, Bocatora clapansaya, by Latin name Spilotus pulatus. You will recognize this species by its body shape. It's pretty slender, very long, color and pattern. 
It is also a colubrid snake that is not dangerous to humans and they will be up to eight feet long and as their name says, uh, they prey on rats as well as birds. We have one more non-venomous snake here that often gets killed for its looks. It's the so-called false fertilans that is much shorter than the fertilans. You can also see that the pattern is quite different from the fertilans with irregular saddles, no regular triangles and dots, and it's patchy. And they have round pupils uh, and a different head as well. Another very small uh, snake, it's the snail-eating snake, or C. sartori, that is again killed for its looks because of the black and red and stripes. Again, for any snake to mimic a dangerous snake is potentially dangerous when around humans, even though this species is again completely harmless and inoffensive to us. So what to do when you meet a snake? <laughs> Rule number one in that situation, as well as probably in life, is don't panic. I stand back and give it some space so that from a distance you can try to identify it and look at those things we talked about, the size, the pattern, the color, the shape of the body, and maybe from a picture, the pupils and the head shape. The good news is that nowadays everybody has a smartphone on hand where you can take extremely good pictures that you can then amplify so that you don't have to go so close. And then you get help and get tools, maybe. So just to introduce some of the commonly used tools, we have the snake hooks here. And then this is a snake bag that will serve as an escape for the snake to go into while you hold on to the handle here from a safe distance. We have a few more examples here of these snake bags or snake baggers. Uh, and then here we have one more tool that can actually be used for restraint, that is the uh, snake tongue. The snake hooks shown before are more for handling, not for venomous snakes that give you a little bit of a safe extension with these snake tongues, though you can grab them, uh, but they also have to be handled carefully to not injure the snakes in the process. The idea with these snake baggers is that in general the snakes are just in the wrong place and they would like to get away and escape as much as the humans would like to uh, see them go, and if given a safe dark uh, escape option into a bag right in front of them, they will often take that. These bags then often have draw strings or strings that go around them to close the bag once the snake is in. Here you can see the draw string and then you can relocate them and place the bag somewhere else, open it and uh, let it go. So we don't recommend trapping snakes, but those are some of the tools that uh, are used. Now some pictures for snake bites. So for the hemotoxic bites, we already mentioned they lead to bleeding usually, and that is reasonably easy to recognize uh, once you have fang marks like this and then persistent bleeding. And then the next step is blistering, blood blisters, and necrosis, and you can see the swelling is already going up the leg here. Uh, there are dry bites, meaning the snake may bite, you may see fang marks, but they control the injection of venom, they control their venom glands. Uh, but you have no chance of determining that from the outside. So if you see fang marks, you need to move to the hospital for sure. 
uh, because if it is a dry bite, you still want to be under observation until that is determined, and you don't want to wait until you see that you are getting serious symptoms before you move to the hospital. Here we have an example of a colubrid snake uh, dentition and bite marks and a viper. So if you were to see two rows of teeth marks in a bite, here you could conclude that that was a colubrid snake bite and not a viper bite, uh, which again there are uh, precautions to take with snake bites in general, not just uh, about envenomation, but this is one way to tell that it was a colubrid bite. So the symptoms of snake bite are very uh, broad um, and affect most organ systems, uh, starting from vision all the way to intestinal effects with diarrhea. But in the case of hemotoxic bites, usually the initial first drastic symptoms are pain and then hemorrhage. Uh, not always, but most times. So what to do? Uh, my apologies for the drastic picture here. That is a consequence of a um, tourniquet, um, something to not use. So, But what to do, first of all, is to keep the victim calm. What will help the most in slowing down any spread uh, will be to keep the victim calm, keep the heart rate and the respiratory rate low. Um, easier said than done, um, but that will have the most impact and then the only, um, only thing to do is go to the hospital. Here are two hospitals uh, close to us here in Belize, but uh, obviously you need to know where your closest hospital is uh, and that is where antivenom would be administered if it becomes necessary. You should inform yourselves uh, which hospitals around you have antivenom if you are in an area that does actually have venomous snakes. So you do want to try to ID the snake, but do not try to capture it. It is quite possible for them to bite more than once, so you do just want to take your picture from the distance. Here in Belize it is a little bit more simple because generally speaking snake bites, viper bites are caused by one species that is easy to identify and all of our uh, pit viper species are treated with the same antivenom. Um, so don't risk getting bit more than once. One thing that you can do on the way to the hospital is you can wash the wound with soap and disinfectant and you can apply antibiotic ointment because even if there is no envenomation any bite wound will tend to get infected and needs to be thoroughly washed and disinfected and antibiotic treatment will most likely be uh, recommended. So now to the list of what not to do. Uh, things that have sometimes been done is to cut once the swelling starts which is thought to relieve the fluid that's accumulating, but in fact, of course, causes further trauma in an already um, hemorrhagic uh, injury. Uh, sucking of bites is not recommended to remove antivenom. Uh, this could lead to fatal consequences in the person who does it if they were to have small lesions in their mucosa and they were to actually become envenomated themselves. There are um, suction applicators that may be carried by people who work with venomous snakes, but they are nothing to go and look for and delay uh, going to the hospital because they need to be applied in the first minute or two after a bite. Um, so again, those will be carried around by people who work with venomous snakes, but in general you will not have that available. So the most important thing is going to a hospital 
And yeah, tourniquets are no longer recommended because of the complications that they will cause A for the distal limb that loses blood supply and B for a um, overwhelming flooding of the organism once the tourniquet is then uh, relieved, uh, leading to uh, shock. So here, another image from the internet, uh, recommendations for what to do for snake bite coming from India. And I like the little graph and the picture, do not panic. And I also found it interesting that they here recommended, oops, oops, sorry, that even if you know that the snake in question is venomous, you should not announce this to the patient in an effort to keep them calm uh, and get them to the hospital with a low heart rate and little spread of any potential venom. Here on this year they have a bandage there as well because for some species of snakes in India that we do not have here, you could actually wrap the affected limb for vipers, pit vipers, that is not recommended. Um, that is said to actually make the necrosis worse. So again, the only things to do, keep them calm, wash the wound and get them to the hospital as quick as possible. So how to avoid snake bite? Seems like common sense. If you walk in forested or underbrush areas, where you can't really see too well, be careful. Do not do so barefoot and do not put your hands where you cannot see. If you know where snakes live, they live under tree trunks and leaf litter and in burrows. Um, you do not stick your hands in there and that minimizes a lot of snake bite risk know that they're active mostly at night. So at night you want to have a flashlight and really watch where you are walking and don't pick them up. And you have a great chance of minimizing your snake bite risk. already. If it comes to handling snakes because you have to do so, then obviously we're talking about uh, using proper tools and that is a different story. How can you deter snakes? How we have complaints, of course, about people who find snakes in their yard and they wonder what to do. Not understanding that a lot of leaf litter in the yard will attract rodents and other small animals that will then again attract snakes who prey on these animals. So if any debris and fallen trees and leaf litter is cleaned up and the yard is kept clean, unwanted plants are removed and any crevices or cracks in the house or in the wall are sealed, that will deter, hence not attract a lot of snakes. And if you don't have rodents, in your yard, then, or hence you control your own rodent populations, however you choose to do so, then again, you will not attract snakes to your yard. There are a number of products advertised on the internet, so-called snake repellents, that have including garlic in them and other ingredients. And after a little research, the experts say those do not work. So keeping a clean yard and sealing your house are your number one options to deter and not attract snakes. So our ultimate goal at BWRC is encouraging coexistence. We do respond to human wildlife conflict calls and when it comes to snakes, they are generally not really competing with us humans for anything, but they are accidentally in the wrong place. And we hope to encourage more people to learn about the 
the amazing benefits and beauty of snakes and to um, let them exist at the same time. So thank you very much for your attention. Let me know if you have any questions. The email is on the bottom of this slide and we look forward hearing from you. Here once more the reference used for almost all of this presentation plus Google Images is the field guide by Mr. Tony Gorell who's also been the person from whom I've learned most of my state knowledge. Thank you once more and goodbye.